Good morning. If you're a guest this morning, uh, my name is uh, Mike Bickley. I serve Jesus on staff here at Journey. And um, last week, I was privileged to be at our other campus, the West Campus. And uh, Colton is there as regular this week. And then Colton will be joining us um, next week here at the Central Campus. And uh, Pastor Mark will be uh, at the West Campus. During Christmas, we we love um, rotating the messages so that each campus gets to hear uh, each message by the uh, different uh, pastors. So I I brought up, this is going to surprise some of you, I brought a golf club up. If you know me, you, you know that that's uh, one of my hobbies, probably the only hobby I'm allowed to have because I do enjoy it. And um, so this gift um, was last year's Christmas present to me, and it's a putter. So if you're not a golfer, like, and you don't know a whole lot about golf, you're thinking, well, drivers, woods, irons, wedges, putter, what's the difference, right? Okay, so... This, first of all, this gift is very expensive, um, multiple hundreds of dollars. Um, my son, uh, JD, uh, who is a PGA golf associate, he picked this out for me. Um, and we talked about it a little bit, but he decided to get it for me. And it's, it's not, uh, it's something that was custom ordered for me. So the offset is what fits me the best. The grip is something that he picked out and ordered to have on the putter for me. And, uh, and so you, you're thinking, okay, well, that's, that's nice. He got you a custom golf club, but there's way more to it than that. So I'm one of those golfers that doesn't hit the ball straight. I'm one of those golfers that doesn't hit the ball really long. And so for me, all of my scoring comes from what they call the short game. It comes from chipping and putting. It, it, it's what they call being able to get up and down. Now, my boys always, uh, when we get in a match with each other, they're never surprised when on the last hole I get up and down from H-E double toothpick and make a putt to have the hole or to win the hole. And they, they would just say, that's so dad-like. So, so the reality is that when my son gave me this, he was buying me the very best to help me do my very best at the very best part of my game. So it wasn't just a great gift. It wasn't just a nice gift. It was a gift that spoke to who I am as a golfer and what what I need to be the best I can be at that best part of my game. So the reason I share that with you is these gifts that the magi, the wise men, are bringing to Jesus aren't just any set of gifts. They're a specially selected group of gifts that speak to who Jesus is and speak to what Jesus would do. So let me just ask you a question. How many of you have ever given gold to a newborn baby? Very few of you, and especially not several years worth of gold. Income, right? How many of you have ever given frankincense to a baby? How many of you have ever given myrrh to a baby? Oh, you have not given myrrh to a baby. I'm watching you now for the rest of the sermon. You know, the reality is we give an outfit or or we give something for the nursery or we give a toy for when they can start moving. And, And so it's the same back then. Like bringing these gifts was... It's hard to, to talk about how out of the ordinary they are. And so this morning, we want to unwrap the significance of one of these gifts, the gift of myrrh. But to do so, I know Pastor Mark read this passage last week. I'd like to read it again this week and walk through you with it. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. And it it tells the arrival of the Magi, the wise men from the east. I'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So magi or wise men is literally a cast of priests 
from the East that were experts in reading the stars and astrology. And, and these ones probably came from ancient Babylon. That's what most historians believe. And if you'll remember your Bible history, Daniel was one of the young Israelites taken into captivity by Babylon. And there he rose to prominence. And he actually was the person that was put in charge of all of the magi uh, of Babylon. And it seems that these magi had had access to the Jewish prophetic writings and specifically to Daniel, who in chapter 9 of his prophecy lays out a timeline of the arrival of Messiah. And then also it seems like they have access to other portions uh, of the Old Testament because in Numbers 24, there's the prophecy that uh, Balaam gave about the birth of Messiah, specifically mentioning a star that would rise and a scepter that would rise out of Jacob. And so uh, these are coming um, because of the birth of the king of the Jews. Verse 3. When Herod heard the king, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So whatever the news was, it got out. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Now I think it's um, interesting to notice that Herod is recognizing this statement about the king of the Jews as uh, the arrival of the Messiah. The word, the phrase king of the Jews was probably the Gentile way that the Jewish people would say the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And so he is understanding the declaration they're making about this person. And, And I think Matthew's making a contrast here. Herod is a king. They don't come to worship Herod. They come to worship Jesus. Herod was installed as a puppet king by Rome. Jesus is being born a divine king, anointed by God, and he is God in the flesh. And so they understand um, what is taking place here um, as something that is Herod understands far greater significance than just the birth of of a normal child. And so notice what it says. They, you know, where is the Christ to be born? Verse 5, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler, a scepter shall rise, who shall shepherd my people Israel. And, you know, Matthew's being very specific here that he wants us to understand that this prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, is being literally fulfilled in the birth of Jesus in that stable in Bethlehem. Verse 7, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, oh, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. You know, we know uh, this is why Jesus called Herod a fox. And because he he was known uh, uh, for the, the conniving and the deception he would use to get his way. And his intention here is not to go and worship Jesus. His intention is to ruthlessly take out Jesus once he finds him. You know, the other thing I notice here is all of Jerusalem knows what's going on. Herod knows what's going on. The scribes and Pharisees know what's going on. There's a declaration that the king of the Jews has been born. Now, if you'll grab grab hold of this, Bethlehem is only five miles south of Jerusalem. It's not a long journey. And none of the Jews want to make the journey. None of the scribes, none of the Pharisees want to go and find out, has the king of the Jews been born? 
The ones who should be most interested are apathetic. And then you have these Gentiles making a journey of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles over a long distance and rough terrain to arrive out of the blue, wanting desperately to know where is the king of the Jews. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them. So it seems to be specifically taking them uh, to Bethlehem until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So it seems to also be specifically identifying the very house where Jesus is. And when they, had, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Now, Mark mentioned a little of this last week, but I, I think it's important for us to just recognize that sometimes we get our biblical facts confused. So how many of you set up a nativity set in your home over the Christmas season, all right? So how many of, the, how many of you does your nativity set have a stable, okay? Who's in the stable? Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus laying in a... And what's around him? All the animals, right? Now, who's visiting Jesus in the manger? The wise men. How many? And what are they bringing? Get gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they got that part right. The Bible never tells us there were just three of them. Okay? The Bible tells us here they don't go to the stable. They go to a house. And the word used for uh, Jesus here is a child, not an infant. So he, most experts believe he's about a year or so old at this time. And so just let's... I'm not saying put away your nativity sets... Um, Because we have several of them. Um, But just be aware that they they are beautiful and they get part of the story correct. Um, Part of it they take liberty with. And so, you know, I always set the wise men way off maybe in another room because they're still on their journey, (laughs) you know. That's how I solved the problem. Because they obviously uh, were traveling soon after the birth of Jesus. Then I want you to notice what they do. They fall down and worship Jesus. And opening their treasures, I want you to realize these gifts are their treasures. These gifts are the sum of their wealth that they are bringing. And they offer him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way, knowing that Herod was uh, being, they were being identified in a dream that Herod should not be trusted with the access to where Jesus is. And then we know Jesus and his parents are going to have a dream to tell them to flee from Egypt. And these gifts are worth years of income. Multiple years of income, probably each one. And so this is what financed um, Mary and Joseph and Jesus being able to make their flight to uh, Egypt and stay there and live during the time um, when Herod was killing all of the babies that were two years old and younger. And so these gifts, I want you to recognize uh, these gifts are not just gifts. They're symbolic gifts. They speak to who Jesus is and what Jesus would do. And so that's why we want to unwrap these gifts for you this Christmas season. And Mark started last week with gold here at the Central Campus. And today I want to speak about myrrh. And as we talk about myrrh, I want you to understand that the wise men are coming not just to pay homage to a king, like they would pay homage to Herod, not at all. They are coming to worship the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the king of the Jews, the one who would rise up and his rule and his reign would last forever and ever. Notice in our passage, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. 
And, and why were they doing that? Because they were worshiping him. And I, I believe they were not worshiping in him as a human king. I believe in accordance with the prophecies in the book of Daniel, which spoke of the Christ having an eternal kingdom. They were coming, recognizing who he was and worshiping him for who he was and what he would do. And that's where we'll come back to at the end of this passage is our worship of Jesus. So the thing we want to un understand is what's the significance of the gift of myrrh given to Jesus? You know, the simplest way I look at it, gold recognized Jesus as the king. Frankincense recognizes Jesus as our last high priest. And, and myrrh recognizes Jesus as the savior of the world. And so I, I want to just trace myrrh for you a little bit through the Bible so that you can see how it would point us to the arrival of the Messiah and the work of the Messiah on the, Christ, on the cross and, and what that means um, for you and I and what it means for our worship. So the first thing to, to understand uh, about myrrh is, is that myrrh was used as a perfume. So if you trace myrrh through the Old Testament, um, you would find that it was very expensive and very fragrant. Um, and you, it, was, it, was, it came from a tree, and it was pulled out of the tree like sap, and then it was distilled into what you and I today would call an essential oil, into an oil. And it was a very long and tedious process and very expensive. And as it was extracted, it became very pregnant. Now, just so you'll know, when you leave today, um, and I've got some on my hands, so I'm smelling it right now. I set up um, two boxes out there uh, in the, what used to be the coffee spot. As you go out to the left, there's a sitting area. There's two boxes with some cotton balls in there with myrrh on them. I would encourage you not to handle the cotton balls unless you'd like myrrh with you all day long. All right? But open one of the boxes if you want to get a, set, a sense of the scent of myrrh and what it feels like. If you are a person who's allergic to uh, the scent, go out that door. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, that's why they're in boxes, so we don't have it all through uh, the auditorium um, and having you smell it. And so one, one of the things you would read about myrrh is it, it was used as part of the combination uh, of the oils that made up the anointing oil for the high priests, for the Ark of the Covenant, and for the tabernacle itself. If you read in the book of Esther, uh, myrrh was one of the perfumes that she was to wear when she was sent into the king. One of the things that's beautiful, Song of Solomon is often seen as a metaphor uh, of the Davidic king and his love for his wife, very real. It's a, it's a wedding, uh, a book about a, a beautiful wedding and a love story. That's the near fulfillment. The bigger fulfillment is it portrays the love of uh, the Messiah for his bride. And, and, and the woman wears a sash, sachet, is that how you say that? Around her neck filled with myrrh. Now one of the first places that you, you see myrrh other than those places in the Bible is Psalm 45. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 45. And what, what I would like for you to understand is most of the psalms um, that are messianic psalms, they have both a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So for example, this is a royal wedding psalm. It was a psalm, a song of worship that was sung at a wedding of a Davidic king. And so it, it became, uh, in its near fulfillment, written and, and utilized for celebrating the wedding uh, of a Davidic king, one in the line of David, uh, to his bride. But it, it was also, in its far fulfillment, it was seen as portraying Messiah and as the one who would love his people. So the ultimate fulfillment in this wedding psalm is Jesus when he dies to purchase his people, his bride, the church. 
So it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, again, looking very prophetically forward to Jesus, um, who was God's son and God the Father sent him, uh, anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. You know, this is probably the psalm that Paul, the apostle, had in mind when he's writing Ephesians 5 about a wedding. And he's saying that there's a bigger picture to the wedding of a man and a woman. It's the picture of Christ sacrificing himself for the church. There's a deeper meaning to the wedding ceremony than just the uniting of a husband and wife together. It's a picture. It's a prophetic picture. It's, a, it's an evangelistic picture of how Christ would give himself up for his bride, the church, and be willing to die for her. And so we see in the Old Testament, myrrh is very much associated with the picture of the royal wedding and the picture ultimately of Christ and his love for his bride. Now, the second way myrrh is used in the Bible is not just as a perfume or, or an incense, it's used medicinally. And, and so myrrh it has very strong properties uh, that allows to, um, and I don't know all the medical way in which this happens, but it, it, it can shut down pain receptors. And so when people were in extreme pain, they would often take myrrh that's mixed with wine as a way to numb their pain. And we see this in the New Testament, specifically in the life of Jesus Christ. When he's being crucified on the cross, Mark 15 says, they brought him to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. In other words, they were offering compassionately the opportunity for Jesus in the midst of his crucifixion to have the extreme pain that he was paying to be numbed down. And he did not take it. And they crucified him and divide his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And so Jesus doesn't want to soften the reality of the sacrifice he's willingly making for you and I. And so we see this picture of myrrh pointing us to Jesus' death on the cross and the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice that he's willing to make on our behalf and his unwillingness to numb himself from what he's willingly wanting to do out of love for you and I. So it's used as a perfume, it's used for medicine. And then third, myrrh was used to embalm bodies. Um, not like the Egyptians embalmed bodies, trying to keep the body to be inhabited later, but, but was used when wrapping linens, they would wrap myrrh and some other uh, uh, fragrant um, spices and oils uh, inside the linens so that the stench of death would be overcome by a fragrant aroma. In John 19, Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 75 pounds in weight, a very beautiful gift. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And so myrrh is being used here to wrap Jesus' body as he's being buried. So if you, you paint the picture of myrrh, you know, as it moves through the New Testament, the first time it arrives in the New Testament it is as a gift to Jesus. The next time that it arrives in the New Testament as medicine on the cross, the third time that it arrives in the New Testament, these are the only uses of it all the way through this portion of the New Testament, is at the burial of Jesus. All of these pointing us to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And as was read just a moment ago, you'll notice when the angels made the announcement to the shepherds who were watching their flock by, 
night. Some of you know the hymn and the Bible. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so myrrh, as you trace it, the, only, the last time um, myrrh will be used in the Bible is in the book of Revelation to speak of the final judgment uh, on spiritual Babylon. And, and so uh, it's just an amazing track. You know, when Colton um, decided, you know, we were talking about this series, and he was like, well, let's each preach a sermon on each one of the gifts. Everybody else got really excited, and I thought, Really? I'm going to spend a whole sermon on myrrh or gold or frankincense? Come on. Well, now I realize there's way more than I could ever delve into. And these are fantastic. And so let's ask the question now, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for our worship? We now understand why the Magi were, according to Scripture, bringing uh, gold and myrrh, and next week you'll understand frankincense and why those are being brought to the baby Jesus. It wasn't just to finance the flight to Egypt. It was way more than that. They're symbolically identifying the aspects of Christ the Savior that God wants you and I to hold on to. And so the question for me is, what should we do? And I want to use, I want to say, be fragrant. Okay, it is myrrh and it's fragrant. So that's where my application comes from. I want you to be fragrant. But I want to take you to a passage in the New Testament where you're commanded and told that you are to be a fragrant aroma for Jesus Christ. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul had come to Corinth and he had proclaimed the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection to them. And as he did that, they responded. And then he's now telling them that in the same way he took the gospel to them, they are taking the gospel to their neighbors and to their friends and relatives and to other people across the world. And in doing that, he talks about this idea of a fragrant aroma. And when he speaks about it, because he speaks specifically about the death of Christ and the death of people and the life that Christ brings and the life that people can have in Jesus, I believe he specifically has in his mind the, the fragrance of myrrh. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him, Christ, everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And then he reminds us who's sufficient to be this person and he'll go on and say, none of us are by ourselves. And that's why God has given us the Holy Spirit inside of us to help us be the fragrant aroma of Christ. So what is he saying here? What's he trying to get across? So think of it this way. Someone dies. I recently did a funeral. Someone has died. The Jews would take the the myrrh and the aloes and the spices. And and as they were taking that dead body, they would wrap it in linen and they would wrap all the spices with it. And they would do several layers of this. 75 pounds of it sounds like a whole lot, right? And so what would happen is it would be that the aroma of the spices would overcome the aroma of death. Does that make sense to everybody? Like nobody wants to smell a decaying body. If anybody has smelled one or smelled a decaying animal's body, you know why no one wants to smell that, right? So they would have a dead body, but there would be a fragrant aroma. If they're burying someone who's resurrecting to eternal life because of what Jesus has done for them, that fragrant aroma reminds them of eternal life and the hope that is everlasting and the reality that this person is going to. But if they're burying a body with no hope, no certainty, no assurance, 
no payment for their sin other than the judgment of them standing before God and being condemned for what they've done on this earth, then the smell of the fragrance is an aroma not to life, but an aroma to death. And what Paul is saying, that as followers of Jesus, you and I are an aroma. Some people we engage with when we share about the life of Christ, we're an aroma to life. They're wanting life. They're wanting forgiveness. They're wanting hope. They're wanting to be transformed. They want to be a new person. They want to overcome the sin that they're trapped in and the bondage that they feel. And the message of Jesus becomes an aroma to life. But then, to some, they're like, don't talk to me about your religion. And they they push us away. And it's because the words that we're speaking are falling on the heart of someone who is dead and unwilling to respond to the message of the gospel. And what Paul's saying here is, look, you're supposed to go through life being a fragrant aroma. What happens to the aroma in the heart of the person you encounter is up to them, not up to you. Can I have an amen? So this Christmas season, I'd like to free you up, and I kind of have three ways that I think you can be fragrant. And the first one is fragrant words that you can use to promote Jesus. You know, a lot of times you and I are fearful of sharing about our spiritual journey of sharing about what God has done in our lives with the people we work with, the people we go to school with, the neighbors that we have. And sometimes it can feel like we're forcing ourselves on it. And I think what Paul is trying to get us to understand in this passage is those words are a fragrant aroma. And you need to speak them. You need to share what God is doing in your life, what God has done in your life. You need to tell people about the things that have changed and the forgiveness you've experienced. And because of Jesus, the forgiveness you're able to give out to other people. You're to be a fragrant aroma. But some people are going to say, don't talk to me about that. I don't want to hear. And your job is to let the words fall where they may. And when they shut you down, then, then you can choose not to speak to them. But you were a fragrant aroma. It just happened in that moment. You were a fragrant aroma to death, reminding them of their separation from God and the stubbornness of their own heart. But there will be others that you will be a fragrant aroma to life. Tell me more. I'd like to know more. Where can I find out more about Jesus? Can you help me discover more about Jesus? And so, I want to encourage you this Christmas season to promote Jesus as a fragrant aroma with the words that you share about what God has done in your life, what God is doing in your life, and about the hope that you hold even when things are hard. Second, notice it says fragrant attitudes that exhibit Christ. I I think a fragrant aroma means it's the attitude that we hold in our heart that we live with. So I want you to understand, I'm not talking about you having a perfect life to post on Instagram or TikTok, okay? When When I say that you should have a fragrant attitude, I'm talking about the heart attitude of hope and perseverance in the midst of trials. I'm talking about the mindset of thankfulness and prayerfulness in all things. I'm talking about the attitude that doesn't resign yourself to the troubles of this world. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the attitude that has the victory of Christ at the end of the world in mind. So the Bible says the world in which we live is twisted, The people and the world is twisted, lost, broken, and without hope. But in Christ, the Bible says we've been set straight, that we have purpose and direction, we're being healed and transformed, and you and I have hope. We have hope. We know the end of the story. We know the outcome. And it's promised to you and I. And so our attitude through life What do we expect the world to be? Broken? Yes. Twisted? Yes. What do we expect the people of the world to be like? Lost? Yes. Hurtful? Yes. Hopeless? Yes. So we're not surprised by it. But we don't resign ourselves to it. Can and amen. The world needs needs those of us that have hope sharing our hope. And the best way we do that is with the attitude. 
and with the words. And lastly, I, I would say with an offering. You know, um, the wise men gave gifts. They brought the king their gifts. When you trace a fragrant aroma um, throughout the New Testament, you'll find that it's, you know, the idea of a fragrant aroma is used here. It's also used in Ephesians chapter 5 to speak of Jesus on the cross. And it's also used in, in Philippians 2 to speak of the gift of money that uh, the Philippians willingly gave over and above uh, what they had been helping Paul with so that he could continue his missionary journeys. And so, you know, this is where our idea, the, our idea of gift giving at Christmas comes from the Bible because the Magi brought Jesus the gifts. And that's, that's where it comes from uh, in the Bible. And I, I think that for us to be reflective uh, of the Magi in their worship, it's not just our words, it's not just our attitude, it's our gifts. And so, you know, at Christmas time, Elizabeth, my wife, is a phenomenal gift giver. Um, and, and I'm very bad at it. So I ride her back all the way through Christmas with a lot of help, right? And we love to see the eyes of people when they open a gift that's been given to them, like the eyes that I had when my son gave me that, that golf club, right? It, it, it says something, and, and, and that's the way she loves to give gifts, and she loves to give expensive gifts, and our Christmas budget's out of whack, you know? And, and how many of you have out of whack Christmas budgets, right? It's, it, it, but it's beautiful, gift-giving. But sometimes I think you and I forget to make gifts to God over and above our regular giving. And so at Christmas time, it's a time when we like to step back. We like to look at God's provision. We like to work, look at God's hand in our lives in the midst of all the trials and all the troubles. And often it, it leads us, actually regularly, it leads us to a gift to the Christmas offering and a gift to some missionaries. Um, and we want to do an over and above gift because of what God has done for us. And so I, I just, I want to encourage you to think about that, that, that giving an extra gift to God's kingdom work. And we love, we love to watch the eyes of people as they open the gifts. And we love to hear the stories of what God does with the Christmas offering. So this is my encouragement to you, to worship the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world, to worship him with the words that you're willing to share to speak into the lives of your friends and your neighbors, your relatives, your co-workers, that tell them about Jesus and his work in your life. The attitude that you carry throughout the Christmas season, an attitude of victory, even in the midst of the battle, knowing that there is hope and that the great hope we anticipate is coming and coming soon. And then third, making gifts, giving gifts to people, giving gifts to God as a way to recognize the grace and mercy the Savior has shown to you. Let me pray for us. God, we just acknowledge that you love for us to respond to you in faith. You love for us to see who you are and and what you are doing, and you want for us to respond in becoming like you. So, Lord, I, I pray that um, we could be a fragrant aroma to the people in our lives, that you would help us to do it with the words that we share and the attitudes we carry and the gifts that we give. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>